So the talk tonight is it's generally focused on actually how inactive tailing storage facilities can fail. Um, but the theory in, that we're going to talk about is applicable pretty much ex entirely to active TSFs. The reason that it's somewhat focused on closed TSFs is that the most recent failure in Brazil was that was fallow, had been fallow for three years. And I think that surprised some people. And I think the fact that a fallow TSF can fail like that is, is something to talk about, that they don't instantly become safe once you turn the spigots off. Uh, just about me, I'm, I work at UWA with Andy Furry, and there's a bit of a cluster happening there now with a lot of tailings research happening that's come out of the last five years because of all the industry interest in doing a better job. So we're part of a team there. Uh, so I think probably everyone in mining has now seen this video. Um, what's an, what's an inter interesting to think about is that a lot of the tailings dams that have failed historically probably looked <coughs> not dissimilar to this, but this is the first time, based on the previous failure, we have actual good video of it. What the, the things to draw your attention to, and that the failure report also discusses, is the, the lack of visible deformation or, or cracking or anything like that up until the moment that you see right there. That's really important because geotech engineers have a long history of depending on things like, is it moving a little bit? Is the water pressure changing slowly? You know, we've got an we've got a inclinometer. Is it is it moving every month? Those kind of those kind of indicators aren't going to help when failure can happen that quickly without any deformation based. A warning. And that's, that's one of the reasons they're so dangerous, is that when, when a loose tailings fails, they do that. Now I'll talk briefly about the soil mechanics of why that can happen, but at a very high level, because I understand you don't want to get buried into laboratory test apparatuses and that kind of stuff right now. But just at a high enough level to inform the case of histories that come later. So maybe less so now, but certainly there has been, I think, a perception that a closed TSF is generally much safer than an active TSF. And that, that's the case, generally speaking, that is the case. When the, the spigots go off, things generally get safer as time goes on. But that can take, we could be talking about 50 to 100 years when things get much safer. And you could have a pretty precarious situation sitting there just waiting for someone to come along and say, let's throw a cover on here really quickly, or let's dig a trench at the toe for drainage purposes. Those kind of things can happen. And if you're not aware of how precarious the, the TSF was beforehand, it can be very bad. Just an outline of what we'll, how we'll go do the presentation. I'm going to put, again, a very high level background on some soil mechanics principles that I think you really need to understand to appreciate how tailings fails and how it fails so quickly and, wh and why there's so little warning in some ways. Then a little bit, a very high level, um, just a schematic model to show why it can take so long for them to desaturate. How even in, a, even in an arid environment like the gold fields of the Pilbara, for example, it can take a very long time from turning off the spigots to that thing being dry in the sense that there's no pore pressure in it or no saturation. That can take a very long time. And uh, it's easy to show why that's the case with, with some very schematic 1D modeling. Then with that, I think the case histories that we'll talk about next will have more value um, because every case history has a particular geotechnical cause. Without having a bit of a high level understanding of that, it might be a bit less informative to talk about those case histories. But I'll talk about, I mean, there's at least 30 tailings failure case histories that we know enough about that you could talk about in this context. The ones I'm gonna talk about tonight are the closed ones. But in between every closed one is an active one that failed probably the same year. Um, the, we're a lot more worried about these in the last five years, but they've been happening continuously for decades. Now they're bigger mining companies, there's larger fatalities, there's better video, there's pension funds. Things are more serious, in, or the reaction's more serious now, but it's been happening for a very long time. And then a little bit of thoughts on if you're coming to a tailings dam and you, or TSF and you want to do some closure works on that, what do you want to know before you start poking and prodding something that might have been sitting there for five years and that no one's thought much about, that maybe you inherited through an acquisition or you know, no one's really thought about for five years? Well, it could be in pretty dangerous shape. Not, I'm, I don't, but I don't want to create, a, create the, the thought that I'm here to say every tailings down is about to spontaneously fail. I really don't want to be that kind of panic, panic monger person. But just that there are very straightforward tools we have right now to, in, to figure out how close to the line you are and whether, how worried you need to be and we need to be doing those checks. Now, what is the simplest way you can talk about soil strength? It, it's, it's too simple to even, it's, it's kind of embarrassingly simple, but it's a very easy way to get this concept across. Soil and tailings, like many other materials, are frictional materials. That means the strength they exhibit in shear is a function of how much effective stress they're under. So the simplest way to think about that is a sandpaper box, a sandpaper block on a desk. The harder you press down on that sandpaper block, the harder you need to push on the side to make it move. That's a frictional material. You can get different grades of sandpaper, and that, that angle will be different. So that's, a sim that's how soil behaves, as simple as that. Okay, great. That, if that was all there was to it, it would be a very simple exercise. 
Turning to soils, the coarser and more angular a soil is, or a tailings are, the higher the friction angle. Gravel, coarse waste rock, very high friction angle. Uh, sand, getting, getting towards clays, lower friction angle, okay? So that's, that's all there is to frictional strength. Just a, a, essentially a linear envelope between those two things. The one nuance for us that some other uh, fields don't have is water pressure, okay? Now, maybe you're familiar with this, but in soil mechanics, it's not just the stress acting at that interface between the block and the desk that you're pushing on the top of the sandpaper block. It's if there's water pressure inside that area, that water pressure can reduce the effect of that vertical stress you're putting on the top. It's called effective stress. So if you could set up this sandpaper block experiment with a little membrane around it and start pumping water into that, into that interface, you could reduce the strength by reducing the effective stress, okay? So water pressure is our enemy. That, that's probably intuitive, but there's a really good physical reason for why that is. Water pressure in there prevents the sandpaper and the desk from interacting in a frictional manner. They can't, they can't create friction against each other if the water's pushing them apart. And the water inside a tailings dam can push the particles apart in a similar way at depth. That's why when you see in soil mechanics, you actually see that particular plot, you'll see effective stress. That's the one subtle difference in soil mechanics than if, if there was a science studying sandpaper block movement, they wouldn't be using effective stress. That's what's important for us, and that's why water pressure is our enemy. So in a tailings dam, what causes that water pressure to block the particles interacting in a frictional manner? Well, there's three, and certainly one, and probably two, are quite intuitive to even people that aren't working in geotech engineering in any way. The third one's the one that really catches people by surprise, and there are far too many geotech engineers who don't appreciate how three works, how it can be triggered, and how, how dramatic it can be, and how quick it can happen. So number one is just a phreatic surface. You've got a big decamp pond, a lot of rain. That's going to make the water pressures in that dam higher in a, very, in a very simple, static fashion. There's nothing really, there's no soil mechanics behind that. It's just a seepage problem. The bigger the decamp pond is, the higher the water table is, the higher the water pressures, the lower the strength. Then there's building your tailings dam too fast or putting waste rock on top of it or something like that on top of it too fast. If you build something on there like that, it creates additional water pressures above and beyond what were there before it was placed. That's a type of excess pore pressure. Shear induced pore pressure can be triggered by those other two things, but it's its own mechanism. Once it starts, it can propagate in its own way. How it's, so we'll talk about three with the schematic in a moment because it's really important. So high phreatic surface is, again, you, I'm sure you've seen these in schematics or reports. Most tailings dams, unless it's a really well-operated filter TSF, are gonna have a phreatic surface in them at some, in some way usually driven by the decamp pond and how the under drainage is functioning or how the foundation is. If you get that element of tailings right there, which is critical for strength, it's near the slope, the frictional strength of that material or how much can be mobilized is very important to whether that slope will stand up or fail. So if you have phreatic surface number one, the whole situation is much less safe than phreatic surface number two. Simply put, the water pressure acting on that element of tailings is higher, the ability of it to be frictional is less. Okay? Very simple. That's the, that's the reason why we want low phreatic surfaces in our tailings dams. That's why we don't want the decamp pond too big out here, because the bigger the decamp pond gets, the higher this line gets. If we don't re remove uh, precipitation that falls on the tailings dam, this gets like this. So we gotta be careful. That's, that's what the high phreatic surface does to the tailings dam. But that's, that's definitely the one that I think everyone, non-geotechs, everyone in mining would be comfortable with that as being an issue. Now turning to the next level, the next stage, that is excess pore pressure. So that is you have a situation where you have a tailings dam, it has a phreatic surface in it, and then let's say, for example, you wanted to close it by putting waste rock on top of the cover, as a cover. Not at all, not at all an uh, atypical situation. If you build that quickly, the, lo the load that's placed is borne by the water first. If the water can't get away, the weight that that generates is, is borne by the water, not by the soil particles. It creates excess pore pressure. It means the water pressures in here are higher than you would think they would be on the basis of that phreatic surface. So that excess pore pressure then makes the slope weaker. So it's not surprising that a lot of these failures happen when something like this is happening. When materials being placed near the crest, often quickly, that can be a, number, a very common trigger of a failure. But it's surprising that that's actually probably not the most common failure of recent, uh, trigger of recent failures. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. And that's, um, that's to do with shear induced pore pressure. The problem with shear induced pore pressure is A, it's dangerous and it makes things like that video happen that happens in 10 seconds, but B, not enough geotech professionals, certainly 
five years ago. Maybe, maybe now we're getting better, are aware of it, can describe it accurately, and can differentiate it from the other type of excess pore pressure, which is induced by placing waste rock. Because they're subtly different, and the physics are different. And it's important to know the difference. Now, this is the last time we'll talk about soil mechanics or element tests or anything like that, so just forgive me. Imagine you have an element of, an element of soil or tailings in a type of testing vessel. It doesn't matter how the, exactly the testing vessel works. You load it with 100 kPa vertically. And let's say this material is loose. You placed it in there as loose as you can. So the particles are barely touching. I mean, it's a schematic, but imagine they're, they're as loose as you can effectively get it in there. And let's say you apply a shear stress to that element of soil. Well, if it's a drained test, and by that I mean you allow water, or, or maybe there isn't water in it, but if there was water in it, you allow it to leave or enter as it wishes. A loose soil, as you disturb it with shear stress, will get smaller. It's called contraction, okay? It's a, it's a very fundamental principle of you know, granular assemblies. It'll get smaller. Now, it getting smaller is good in itself, if, if it can be allowed to do that. It's now denser, it's now stronger. So it's been sheared, but that's good, okay? It's gotten denser and stronger. It's, it's a denser material. But let's add the water factor into this. Let's imagine that this same testing vessel is sealed. It's full of water. Water can't enter or leave. And then something happens to it, a very small thing, that causes a small amount of shear stress. Well, it wants to get smaller now, pretty dramatically in some cases, but it can't because the water pressure is going to bear that load. The water's not going anywhere. The particles try to get closer. The water's in the way. The water pressure goes up. Water pressure goes up, effective stress goes down. Ability to mobilize friction goes down. This is, this is it. This is, why this is why tailings dams fail, really. This, every single tailings dam that's failed has been because of shear induced pore pressure. Okay? Whether it's the clay below Mount Polly, or the sand above the slimes at Fundau, or the tailings behind the, you know, above the clay at Cadia, or all the tailings at the Brazil failure at Bermudino. That's, that's what's happening shear induced pore pressure. And in, often it's very small things that push you over this line. If you look at, you know, this is an actual um, data from a test on tailings, but what type of tailings it is and all the preparation and don't, don't really matter that much. What matters is if you apply that shear stress to this element of soil, when it's sealed, you get a very a peak strength, and then as the water pressure starts to build up and the, and the situation gets out of control, it can't even maintain that shear stress and it drops rapidly because its ability to generate friction, but the friction can't happen anymore because the water pressure is going up so fast. Okay, so that's, that's what we call brittle. A very, so you know, it was loaded, it hits a peak, and it rapidly falls and loses that strength, okay? And if that happens in a tailings dam, that can be very bad. Now when that happens, notice the water pressure in here, excess water pressure being generated by the shearing process goes from zero to 500 kPa. A relatively small perturbation happened to this, this element of soil in a lab test, and the water pressure in it has gone to 500 kPa. So 50 meters of head has just been generated in 10 seconds in a laboratory test. That, that's how tailings dams fail, like in an element. That's the simplest way to think about an element of tailings in those dams failing, because that's fast. When you hit a peak like that and it starts to drop, things are going to happen very quickly. Because often we do these lab tests very slowly, what's called displacement controlled. We move them one millimeter per minute, but life is stress controlled. A tailings dam is stress controlled. If it can't bear that stress anymore, it's going to fail very quickly. And the thing that pushes it over this top, the, the final increment that causes that can be a very small thing. If you've got a tailings dam that's right on the line, it doesn't take that much of that elast raise or much of that waste rock to be placed or even much of that phreatic surface rising to cause that, that kind of chain reaction. And that's why tailings dam failures look like this. Because when something loses 90% of its strength in 10 seconds, it goes a long way. It has to travel a great distance to re-achieve equilibrium. This is a failure from um, Kentucky in the 60s. It, fail, it, it's, it looks almost exactly like the failures we have. It's the exact same physics as the failures today. And it's funny that when this happened, there was a big cluster of people getting very interested in tailings in the late 60s and early 70s, writing really good summary papers on how we need to be careful about shear induced pore pressure and high rates of rise and water pressures and all these things. You can imagine that people were probably having meetings like this. And then after five or 10 years, it all kind of, you know, there wasn't as much interest again. So there's been a few histories, a few periods in um, you know, geotech and tailings practice where there's been a bit of a spike in interest in failures and it's kind of receded a little bit. So there's been some lost knowledge along the way. Now, all, all, everything, all that thing about water pressure implies that the tailings are saturated. None of those things are an issue if the tailings have drained down or if you've got a filtered stack that has successfully been 
it's never been saturated through successful operation. So if we remove the water pressure, things are good. But the question is, what kind of time scale after the day you turn the spigots off, is that tailings dam going to be unsaturated? You know, not, not, not enough water in it that it can generate pore pressure through any of those mechanisms. It can be quite a long time, uh, unfortunately, even in an arid environment, because the evaporation that we see, say in the gold fields, for example, is going to dry out the top, what, one meter before a salt crust forms. That evaporation on the surface of a closed TSF does not act 10, 20 meters down. You're often being controlled by what the foundation below is like or whether you happen to have under drainage, and if that dra under drainage is operating. In many cases, it's not, because it's been left fallow for 10 years, it's salt, the pipes are clogged with salt. So there's a lot of reasons why it won't desaturate as quick as you want. Now, okay, I guess I was lying, that there is one last little soil mechanics um, figure. If you do, sorry, if, if you do a lot of seep, if you, you might, some of you might be involved in seepage modeling. This is what's called a soil water characteristic curve, or a form of it. It just shows how two different materials, one on the sand end of the spectrum, one, in, one on the clay end of the spectrum, look as they desaturate. It's just showing how much suction, <coughs> which I, by that I mean negative pore pressure, needs to be applied to those materials for them to start to desaturate. And clays, it takes, a much more, it takes much more uh, suction to be applied to them for them to lose water. Okay, so the two here, these are just, these are just rough, uh, you're, um, generated to fit data. The, um, the blue one, clay tailings, is, I'm trying to fit roughly what a more fine grain tailings on the kind of iron ore, um, you know, some nickel adorites, maybe some alumina residue might be. And the, the orange one is more on the coarse end. So the coarse fr uh, fraction of a uh, gold tailings, maybe some of the mineral sands, sand fractions, stuff like that, more on the sandy end. Most tailings we deal with are gonna fall in this envelope in somewhere. So it's just two examples just to span the, span the range. Let's say we take a 50 meter high column. It's a tailings dam, 50 meters high, one meter, just a one meter unit column. Let's say that it's fully saturated at the beginning of, uh, beginning of this model, and then we stop deposition and we let drainage go at the bottom of it. So this, even, this is not, even this is not conservative. This is assuming you have perfect drainage at the bottom that's working perfectly, okay? Which isn't the case in almost all the time. So at the end of deposition, you've got this, this, this hydrostatic profile. You know, every, every meter you go down, the water pressure goes up 10 kPa which is not that common, not that uncommon near, say, the decamp pond or in the groundwater. And then if we leave it for 10 years and 50 years, we do start to develop some negative pressures. If there is drain down happening. Okay, we're talking about a very large time scale here, but drain down is happening. We get to, on the surface here, we're getting to, you know, negative 300 kPa. <coughs> At the bottom, it's less effective because the water from the top is headed down, has to pass through that material to get out. But let's look at that in terms of percentage saturation. Because even though maybe the suctions have developed to maybe negative 200, for example, you, that only means the saturation is still above 95% because it's a clay-like material. So a clay tailings dam, 50 years later, can still be essentially saturated just sitting there, even in an arid environment. And all the t um, I've worked on a couple closed TSFs that have been recommissioned, and we go out there and we're kind of half expecting it to be drained down, and they're not. They're, they're, it's barely fallen. So this, this is a, just because it's closed doesn't mean it's all of a sudden drained down. And just turning to the same kind of plot of saturation at, at 10 years, this, if you have a, a tailings on the more sandy side, yeah, sure, you'll be in better shape. It will have drained down more effectively. But even so, it'll still be not that far off saturation even 10 years later. And this is a, this is a pretty non-conservative example, just assuming that it can perfectly drain at the bottom, which is generally not the case. But if you start modeling the foundation, it becomes a second order, and it's not really appropriate for you know, a schematic presentation. What's, you know, what's interesting to note about the um, investigation into that failure, the Brumadino failure, is that that, that TSF was fallow, fallow for about three years, and the phreatic surface had only fallen by about three meters based on their data. So, now yes, that's a more, much higher rainfall there, but it's not really because of the rainfall that that happened. The rainfall wasn't interacting too much with where the water table was in terms of how it was dropping. So, you know, and the three meters there clearly was not enough or enough of a drop or enough of a reduction in water pressure to create an all of a sudden safe TSF based on what happened. So three years was, was not enough in that case, to say the least. We have the science to do these, these type of analyses very easily. Um, if, you're, if you're in the science that does this, you'll find this presentation embarrassingly simple, and I apologize, but there are people that are experts at this in terms of how long drain down will happen and how to test it and model it. But we have the science to do that in a, in a closure design. Okay, so all, all the theories behind us, the case histories I think will be more interesting now, 
some of which you may be very well familiar with, but if not, I think some of them will be interesting to see. So Samurgo in South Africa, Pinto Valley in Arizona, which is really a really good case history for West Australia. Katy in Australia, which isn't a closed TSF I acknowledge, but there's a lot of things happening there that were very interesting and relevant to closed TSFs and more generally. <coughs> Mary Sprate in South Africa, which was nominally a closed TSF, the one that failed, but was being used inappropriately. But um, again, there's some important lessons there. And lignite mines in Germany, which have been failing or were failing in a, in a pretty frequent manner um, that had been closed and that we're having these flow slides near lakes that are not tailings dams, but I think are quite relevant to the discussion of, you know, closed TSFs, closed landforms. Samurgo in South Africa, like essentially all the TSFs there, upstream raised, and like most here, it had been fallow for 20 years after the end of deposition. So, sorry, all this data is coming from um, Jeff Blight's textbook, which is a, a good resource. It's been fallow for 20 years. There's no poor pressures in the tailings when they go into a, a, an investigation to figure out if they can use it a little bit more. So there's no poor pressures in there. So there's no poor pressures, but it's still saturated, okay? It's kind of like those figures from previously. As part of the hydraulic remining works on this particular TSF, they need to store some slurry on top of the TSF in the area where it failed. This, because it was essentially on the, on the borderline of being saturated, that additional relatively small amount of water and slurry was enough to resaturate the entire stack and lead to a failure. So what hap what's interesting, it's, it's a fascinating case history that's probably not appreciated enough, is that yeah, when they went there to do the, the redesign to whether they can uh, remine it, the phreatic surface was, was at the ground level. So the tailings were at that 99% saturated, you know, just not quite saturated, not, not with a, a poor pressure you could measure in a conventional sense, but very close to, the, to being saturated. So if they go ahead and put a relatively small amount of new slurry on top, the, the weight of the slurry plus the, the water within it was enough to resaturate and cause a, a rise of about 20 meters in one month of the water level which is a reasonable way to trigger a failure on a TSF that in this case was already on the line. They probably were lucky it didn't fail during operations, and then they got away with it, closed it, came back 20 years later and put that last little bit of load on it, and that was enough. So this is not, this is not case history that's not at all unusual for what we might deal with in, say, the gold fields. There's a lot of, there's a lot of you know, TSFs that have been sitting there for a little bit that are getting re recommissioned in some cases. I know I've been involved in some, so this is something to keep an eye on for sure. Just because it's been there for 10 years doesn't mean it's not you, could, you don't be the one that does that last one meter that causes a problem. Now Pinto Valley, again, is another really good example for, for our, our context here. Upstream raised, Arizona has got a pretty similar climate to uh, parts of WA. Um, and then a flow slide occurred there when they were placing waste rock for the cover. You can see, actually, there's not, the photos, it's 90, so it's kind of like scanned, you know, normal camera, so it's not as um, good photos. But there's, a, I think it's about 20 meters of waste rock being placed on there with haul trucks relatively quickly leading to a flow slide. So there were saturated loose tailings under there in the area where it failed, and as they went near the perimeter, that was enough to cause it to fail. So it's like the, the mechanism two schematic of that rapidly placed material on top of a saturated tailings. This is a photo, again, the, the qualities are they're not that great, but that's the area of failure. That's the flow slide down the river valley, and you can see the waste rock perimeter of where they were advancing about there. See, it looks like pretty much this is the area they got closest to the edge first because it's probably least safe here. This is where the embankment's probably the highest, but they never got all the way to the edge in the waste rock there, whereas the place they were closest is the place where probably it failed, roughly speaking, I mean, without doing an investigation. So they probably would have failed it here if they'd have ended up pushing that, that waste rock out there first. I, I don't know, I've not been able to read like what was done in terms of pre-failure pre -failure design investigations, but it's pretty clear something was missed in terms of was it saturated? Was it loose? Could this happen with a rapid loading event? But again, a lot of closed, a lot of closed TSFs that we have sitting around for 10 years that we might want to cover. And, you know, and I don't want to be pessimistic because this would have been very easy to do. You could have very easily put the waste rock around the outside to buttress it first. It would have been very simple to do that. So it's not like you couldn't have closed this. You just needed to spend you know, a week doing geotech investigation, a couple weeks planning, and you would have known right away just to change your plan. Easily could have closed this still. So it's not it's not that we can't close them, we just need to think a little bit carefully about how we do it, the order we do it, and what we do to find that out. That's an example of, uh, no one, there were no fatalities in this one. They were quite lucky in, in that person, I think, could get out there. And um, yeah, it's not that well-known in case history, but uh, I got some photos off um, Lawrence Hansen, which I really appreciate, because you can't find them that easily on the internet. <laughs> <laughs>
But again, just to bring it back to the earlier you know, theoretical schematics, you got an element of tailings in here. It's saturated. It's under, it's, 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 a, it's under a certain amount of water pressure. A bunch of waste rock gets placed on top of it. The tailings can't bear, the, the water bears that pressure first. It reduces its strength and it can cause a failure. The strength of this element of tailings essentially is lower. The thing can fail. It's, it's really as simple as that. There's not, sure, the, there's a whole bunch of science between how you figure out how loose it is and how you measure the pressures and how you do all that design work. But in general, it's just saturated, loose tailings loaded too quickly. That's what, that's what a lot of failures are caused by. Now, Cadia we'd probably be quite familiar with in the industry, uh, having been closer to home and you know, being in a more modern context on the internet and everything like that. Um, as it turned out, things, it was, things went about as good as a failure could go in terms of no fatalities, ability to reopen relatively quickly, um, having a pit available. You know, as far as failures can go, this was a, a good wake-up call, but it was very lucky in some ways. Now, yes, this was an active TSF, but it's funny, if you're thinking about uh, cl you know, closed TSFs and, and closing them, a lot of things that were happening here that triggered this failure are quite relevant, even in a closure context. They're also relevant in, a, in an active TSF context as well. It's a, it's a fantastic um, case history to read. <coughs> so this is a schematic of the Cadia, T the Cadia TSF, North TSF, that failed uh, just before failure, or actually, sorry, about a year before failure. Um, I've digitized it off the uh, panel reports because I wanted to do my own modeling on it, so it's just, because I don't want to, you know, there's copyright issues sometimes of using their figures. Um, so what you have is, it's actually a bit of a different arrangement than we typically would have. You have a pretty large downstream embankment built almost like a water dam. You know, internal zoning, um, clay, filters, that kind of stuff. Like, that's pretty, you know, that's not going to fail on its own. That kind of tailings dam generally doesn't fail unless something with the foundation goes wrong, which in this case it did. Then, of course, switched upstream raising. Um, for whatever reason, a lot of upstream raising, uh, maybe nine lifts, I think, and a lot of saturated loose tailings behind them, okay? But this in itself isn't that unusual. I mean, we have a lot of situations like this all around Australia. Maybe it's, a bit, it's a, probably a bit higher, and there's probably an argument that if you convert from downstream to upstream, you can get yourself in trouble sometimes, because when you operate an upstream TSF, usually you're pretty worried about things like drawing that tailings out and, and cycling your deposition very carefully which generally makes the tailing stronger. But if you have a downstream TSF for 10 years, you don't need to worry about those things. You're just pushing that tailings out there and you're generally not worried as much about things like desiccation, layer thickness. So then when you go and swap over to an upstream, you're, you've got the issues of an upstream on top of something that might not have been dried as effectively or managed as effectively in, in that way. So it, it can be a bit of a thing you have to be careful about. But that's not, a, that's not what really triggered this particular failure. What was happening there was Someone new came in, a new consultant came on board, I believe, um, from reading from the text, and um, realized that it was not meeting standards in terms of, uh, based on their design, it wasn't meeting standards in terms of required factors of safety. So they wanted to buttress this facility, which is a very, buttressing is a great thing to do if you're worried about a tailings dam that's not safe. And often there's a lot of waste rock on these mines and it's, it's a pretty easy solution if it's done properly. What seems to have happened is that the, the eventual buttress was going to be all the way to the ground because generally you would build a buttress from the ground up. You wouldn't go throwing material on the slope without having built it up from the ground. I think non-geotechs would find that intuitive as well. But for l the reasons that aren't exactly clear in the report that I'm sure maybe come out someday, they, in this particular area, they wanted to build the buttress first on the benches. They were worried more about failure services that pass through this particular area and not the embankment below which makes a lot of sense in, in many ways. That's what you'd be more worried about because the upstream raising is a, is a higher risk. At the same time, they were removing between three to five meters of tailings at the toe here in order to remove um, uh, the unsuitable material because they wanted to place waste rock at the toe as well. But you can't really go throwing waste rock on top of what is you know, old tailings and mud that's not in good condition without removing it first from a construction point of view. But the combination of placing material here and re removing material there can be very negative in the context of overall how the system behaves. What it turns out that the, there was this, this particular area had very weak type of clay in it. And so the combination of loading here and removal here caused that clay to shear. And it was already shearing, but that additional shear caused it to lead the tailings above to liquefy. Because if that clay starts to move to the left, the tailings over here have less effective stress because they're losing confinement on one side and they can then liquefy, and then shear-induced pore pressure occurs. And that's what the panel proved through various testing and modeling. 
But the reason it's interesting, and even in a closure context, is that the amount of material that's being placed here and the trimming out of a, of a toe are not, those are things that could be happening in a closed TSF as well. Oh, let's put some new material on the slopes. Let's clean these drains out. You know, it just shows that very small perturbations on something that was through decades has been created in an unstable situation can be what pushes it over the edge. And you don't want to be the person that digs the one meter trench extra and one meter deeper and causes that to happen. Now, um, Mary Sprait, you will probably be familiar with as well. It's a relatively well publicized failure in South Africa. <coughs> What's interesting is the one that failed, the, the cell that failed was, was fallow at the time. It had a way too big pond and it was actually being used for um, you know, not appropriate deposition of water in some tailings, which caused that pond to remain near the edge. But it, it was actually a fallow TSF in, in general. There was no rate of rise. There was no walls being built. What was happening was the uh, operator were, was placing tailings and water onto what was a fallow TSF at that, uh, that wasn't supposed to be operated. It wasn't really being, they weren't keeping a very good eye on it. And it, the pond was getting near the edge. There'd been a lot of historic issues with pond control at that particular TSF. <clears throat> so rather than being near the decant where you'd want it, the pond ended up being near the perimeter. And then what happened was a very small rain event happened, which was just enough to push cause overtopping in that area. Because it was already, the pond was already where you don't want it, and it was already close to the freeboard. So a very small rain event was enough to cause overtopping. And what's interesting about this, this case history is overtopping started the process, and it was that water was actually flowing through the village for a few hours before the failure happened. And people weren't that worried from what I understand. But eventually the water removed enough of the material, the confining material at the toe to trigger a liquefaction event that then caused a much larger amount of tailings to flow through the village. And that's what caused the fatalities. And it happened very quickly. There was a loud bang was heard, which is what's commonly heard in these events. When a, when a tailings liquefies on a large scale, often people hear a bang because of the amount of energy being released. People often see something on a seismic record they think might have been an earthquake, but actually was the tailings dam failing rather than a cause of the, you know, a cause, not the effect. That's kind of the scale of the, uh, of the event there. In terms of the actual loss of tailings, it was relatively small. <coughs> there are some good reasons why that particular area of the TSF was a low point and was looser than elsewhere. Um, it's been a low point throughout the history of that TSF. So the fact that the overtopping happened in that weak, weak area is, is not that surprising when you look at the history of that facility. This is the, uh, the erosion as it was happening before the failure occurred, before the major failure occurred. So this is a, there was someone out there who happened to be a pretty good uh, you know, amateur artist and did this sketch, didn't have a camera with them. Um, so overtopping was occurring because of that small rain event, causing this area around the toe to be removed. That again is that's removing the effective stress of that soil in a sense inside the embankment. So schematically, if you've got a very, very schematic section of Mary's root, as the overtopping happens, it starts to remove a bit of the toe, which reduces the kind of, in a way, reduces the effective stress on the side of this material here. It reduces the confinement on that, on that soil. It also increases the shear stress on that soil, or tailings, that then causes that to liquefy. So a very, again, a very small perturbation here. So an old TSF that hasn't, doesn't have water management that's uh, correctly implemented, that could have erode, could, you know, you don't want the toe eroding on a, on a closed TSF, even if it's been sitting there for a few years. You also clearly pond control. I think that's the first lesson in tailings storage is not to have a large pond directly adjacent to the perimeter. That's basic tailings design. That, that was an issue there as well. But the, the important point is it's a very, it wasn't that big of a disruption at the toe to cause this larger cascading event. You know, it could have been erosion. It, a lot of rain events can cause erosion on a toe. A lot, of, a lot of closure works can cause people to be modifying the toe or the drains in some manner as part of a, a, a closure work. So you just gotta be really careful poking these things if you don't, aren't confident in how safe they are. So this, this case history, um, again, I gotta, I gotta thank Andy Faree for this, these slides because he's, he's shown me about this. He learned about this from someone at a closure conference in Germany. And it's interesting because it's not something you hear as much about. Um, being not, not tailing specifically, uh, being mining, but maybe East Germany, you probably don't, or well now, you know, Germany, you don't hear as much about maybe some of these failures in the mining industry here at least, but they're fascinating both from, a both from just a general mining perspective and from what's triggering them or what's, what seems to be triggering them. So at the, I guess at the time of um, when East Germany reunified and was exposed to the market, a lot of those, a, lot, a huge amount of their coal tailings uh, mines had to close, or coal, the coal, sorry, coal mines had to close. No longer economical, so large amounts of coal mines were closed. Production fell enormously, um, which meant there was a whole bunch of closed 
mines and closed waste stockpiles and things like that. So in 2007, the first, what they call it a groundbreak occurred. Because what would happen was these, um, these mines, these pits, had been dewatered during mining. At the end of the, um, once they were all stopped, that, started, that water started to rebound. So these, these, in some cases, stockpiles of waste material were then resaturated by what essentially became lakes in some of the disused area. And these lakes were actually quite, apparently, quite popular real estate to be near because all of a sudden, once the mines closed and they'd done some rehabilitation, there's these nice lakes formed in what might not be that far from a city, for example, or a good place to retire. So some of the land around these lakes became real, quite you know, good real estate. Um, so, but then as the water started to rise and maybe rose a bit further in some cases, it caused spontaneous ground breaks where material near those lakes would flow into the lake in a, in a relatively fast, catastrophic way. Um, it, but it kept happening. So it started in 2007, kept happening. It's been happening since, from what I understand. And at the time, the mining industry there had published documents saying, we're a bit puzzled about why this is happening. We don't really understand the physics of this. Um, from a paper in 2016, um, von Bismarck talking about how you know, evidently something's missing in our geotechnical models, or the belief that these tr things can be triggered from such a small perturbation seems to be the case, and they never thought that but before, perhaps. Reality, in their view, has overtaken science. Now, that is more a case of not reading, perhaps, the right, the right literature in this case, but I understand that they've looked at that more now, I think. So what would, what would happen is you'd have these, these pits that have been dewatered, and adjacent to them or in the area, you'd have areas of stockpile of loose, sandy material placed very loose without compaction. So loose, that's, the, that's a bad thing for us. Loose material, when it shears, wants to get closer together and cause water pressures to go up. When you turn the dewatering off and the water level starts rising, even if it's slow, that's enough to cause that effective stress in the soil to produce, and in some case, push it over the, end, push it over the limit and fail. So that was what was happening. Um, the materials were generally loose, gravelly sands, sandy gravels, stuff like that. Things that are very prone to liquefaction and contractive behavior when they fail. So the, the frictional strength can reduce significantly under the right conditions. This is an example of one of those, you know, the real estate and what was happening to it near some of these areas. Uh, a lot of areas had to be, that the houses had to be given up and, you know, people ever had to move out of them because no one could live there anymore. It wasn't safe. Significant areas have had that happen. Um, they usually occur without any warning. So again, we're come circling back here to very similar to some tailings failures. It's the same physics that we're seeing here, without, with little to no warning in terms of deformations or cracking. From the waterfront backwards, only a few minutes, so again, very fast. And they may be relatively large, hundreds of meters in some cases. One of them, four and a half million cubic meters flowed, three fatalities, houses submerged, and more land lost. So turning to, this applies really to, to all TSFs, but just, keeping on the focus of maybe closed TSFs a little bit, things that can be a real problem with a closed TSF are, if you have a major unprecedented rain event that you're bigger than what you might have had in the last few years of operation, or a very bad wet season, that could be enough to push you over the line. You might create phreatic conditions inside that tailings storage facility that never existed before <coughs> because you have a bad wet season the year after you close. It looks like the wet season in Brazil leading up to that failure was worse than the previous few years, and it was the worst one since closure based on the amount of precipitation in that area. If you start storing water on a, on a closed TSF, or any TSF, or, or just generally have bad water control, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a definite issue. The higher that water level gets, the closer you are to failure, across the board. The higher the water near the perimeter, the less safe the tailings dam is, or tailing storage facility is. And closure-related works, or works in general, <laughs> such as placing cover material near the perimeter, reshaping the slopes, or digging channels at the toe, all of those, while maybe small in themselves, if you happen to be at a, a TSF that's on the line, can be enough. So you just want to be careful that you're not the person that builds the extra one meter drain. Uh, now, again, I don't want to panic monger. I'd say that probably 95% of tailings dams, if you dig a one meter drain at the toe, is going to have no issue at all. You just really want to be sure that you're not the 5% when you dig the drench. That's the main, you know, the main point. The, I mean, from the case histories, a lot of important, what I kind of already touched on, is that you, things can be very close to failure without any visual, visual evidence. You're not necessarily going to see cracking on a crest of a TSF the day before it fails. So do not rely on that. That's not to suggest that inspections aren't important, but perhaps in the historically too much emphasis is placed on walk on the crest every day and saying there's no cracking. There was no cracking at that Brazilian TSF the day before it failed. Okay, so cr that's not going to necessarily tell you. There was no cracking at Cadia the day before it failed as far as I know. 
It was about four hours of worrying they had, I think. So it's, it's you know, cracking the day before is not going to necessarily be there. It can be quite a slow process. The, the water table rise does not have to happen quickly to push you over the edge. There's also a misconception that that water, it needs to be a huge precipitation event causing a rapid rise for it to trigger. No, it could be a bad wet season causing that phreatic surface to rise one meter a month or something like that. That's enough to push it if it's at the, in the bad situation. So just in terms of recommendations, I mean, I'm a geotech engineer, so I don't want to, you know, but geotech, engineer, geotech investigations of tailings dams are crucial if you're going to start changing them or operate them in general. All, every single failure we could have prevented if we'd had the right geotech investigation. Every single one. There's not some magical physics that we've discovered on, on new failures. Yeah, we, we do learn things on each failure for sure, and we learn better ways to analyze them and better ways to update our methods, but there's no failure that you shouldn't have been, the people involved shouldn't have said, this is not looking good. So that, that's pretty much every single one. And tailings are generally, the way they're deposited and the way they're operated, the material's generally loose, it's often saturated, and it's generally brittle. Brittle means not much warning if it fails. That's pretty common with a lot of tailings. So that's, that's, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge Maybe. Professor Andy Furry, who's, I got to borrow some slides off him for this, Lawrence Hans Hansen at AMEC, who's been really nice sharing some photos of, of um, Pinto Valley, and everyone at Oz IMM, Chris and Allison, who asked and helped organize uh, doing this today. So thanks.